Now, what are the expected outcomes after fibroid embolization? One is you get an anticipated size reduction in 50 to 60 percent patients. The uterus itself will come down in size in 40 to 50 percent patients. But symptomatic relief from pressure effects is seen in close to 90 percent patients. Reduction or elimination of excess of bleeding is seen in 90% cases and elimination of symptoms is seen in 85%. So we got an 85% patient group who will be satisfied after the end of this extremely minimally invasive procedure. What are the outcomes? We expect to see reduced bleeding in the first cycle, improved pain, pressure symptoms by 4 to 6 weeks, Progressive improvement over many months, at least for one year. Successful treatment of fibroids. What are the reasons we can have recurrence? Most of it is because an area is not it. And this can happen because of the supply that we may get from the ovarian artery. Now when we talk about uterine ligation, though it again appears to be a simple laparoscopic technique, the problem is you never get complete fibroid infarction and so the success rate or the long term reduction in size is also never as good as fibroid embolization. So incomplete fibroid infarction is what is expected with a laparoscopic ligation. And uh, we said infarction failure correlates very well with short or mid-term treatment. Have a look at this picture. This is the baseline. Look at three months, one year, and three years. So we find as we go down the line that a patient shows significant improvement in the size of the fibroid. This is another case, baseline, it's three months, one year, and then you find it two years, and then at three years, the uterus has become close to normal. What are the complications? Pain is seen in 90% of the cases. Local complication is seen in 2%, that is local hematoma or uh, bruising at the site of the uh, arterial puncture. And others, 8%. This could mean infection or uh, even in some patient, DVT. What are complications that are described in the literature? Transient amenorrhea is seen in 5 to 10 percent. Permanent, less than 45 years, 3 percent. More than 45 years, 7 to 14 percent. Transcervical fibroid expulsion is seen, to, is seen in uh, 0 to 3 percent, but this is only for patients who are submucosal fibroid. Non-infectious endometritis, 1 to 2 percent. Endometrial or uterine infection, 1 to 2%, DVT, less than 1%, and uterine necrosis, less than 1%, non-target embolization, less than 1%. We have to remember, finally, that serious complications are less than 2% of patients. Fibroid passage may take in 2 to 3% of patients. It's important to tell a patient that something like this may happen lest they get worried when they see it happening. They may have severe cramps, foul smelling discharge, heavy menstrual bleeding, all of them in this 2-3% to three person who have a fibroid expulsion. 50% of patients may need additional instrumentation in this group. That's what they're saying. We had a submucosal fibroid and hysteroscopic evacuation was the right way to do it, but that is seen only when the fibroid is large. The diagnosis of this condition is usually confirmed by MR uh, because sometimes it can be worrisome. You have a patient that is foul spelling discharge, you're worried whether the uterus is infected, and MR can help you because it shows a lot of mixed signal intensity material lying within the uterine cavity, and the main fibroid itself uh, kind of degenerated and fragmented. And the treatment is antibiotics and NSAIDs. Misembolization is actually a rare event and the territory is reasonably safe. Uterine infarction literature says 1 in 400 patients, but if it takes place, the patient would require an hysterectomy. 
thromboembolic complication, again a rare complication where you may have dilated veins in the pelvis and they may thrombose and result in pulmonary embolism. Four deaths reported in 50,000 patients worldwide. We have to accept that among all the procedures for fibroids, this is the safest. Post GFP amenorrhea can be worrying, but remember this is commonly seen after the age of 45 or in a perimenopausal age rather than in an age which the patient is actually uh, young, say in 30 or 40s. Now, many people may have a, uh, you embolized and for two to three months they don't have the cycles and then it comes back again. So up to six months we generally don't worry. Permanent amenorrhea, like we said, is seen in 2 to 5, but most of them will be beyond 45 years. Most common in women over 45. There has been studies to show if you look at the follicular stimulating hormone, we will find that there is no change in women under the age of 45, but over the age of 45, 15% will show a decrease in this. Now when we talk about pregnancy, though there are several reports now coming that people after fibroids have embolized, but still I believe that if there is another way that you can treat the fibroid in a patient who wants to have children, try that out first. By that I mean, if possible, if you can do a myomectomy safely, that should be the first option and not UFV. Uh, and uh, the thing is that one more important thing to understand is that the risk of postpartum hemorrhage, spontaneous abortion after uterine embolization were higher than that with laparoscopic myomectomy. However, these differences were not significant, but again, I believe that the radiation to the ovaries, all these are issues, and it's better not to do it for a patient who wants to get pregnant. Uh, so like I said, we did not know the fertility rates, where there still may be unintended consequences and we know for sure that myomectomy does not have any of these issues and should be the preferred choice. Current recommendation, myomectomy if pregnancy is desired. But like I said, you may have a situation, patient has got multiple fibroids, who goes for myomectomy, the chances of losing the uterus is high, then of course we can still think of UFE. Now, uh, this is a study to show that why is it that we have failure rates. And uh, people believe that the supply of the fibroids from sources other than the uterine arteries, maybe the ovarian arteries is an issue, spasm of the uterine arteries may result if you are a beginner and you, you, know, you try to go a little deep into it uh, and it can be a problem, so it's good if you want to do it, give nitroglycerin. Clumping of embolic material may result in a false endpoint. Make sure that your agent is distributed evenly or clumping can be a problem and you'll get proximal occlusion. So this is an old article, 2002. But just to let you know, even the gynecologists accept today that this procedure is here to stay. And I think that is the bottom line. Whether people like it, whether they dislike it, but the bottom line is, this is a procedure, there is scientific evidence, it's here to stay and it's time we started using this procedure and giving it the due importance it requires. Thank you.